Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to a very special programme, which is being held as part of National Interfaith Week 2020. This is the time of year that the RE department at Kings Norton Girls School likes to celebrate the diverse voices of faith and belief in Birmingham. Events like these contribute towards the spiritual, moral, social and cultural development of our students and also reflects the school's active commitment to promoting mutual respect and tolerance of those with different beliefs. Now, normally, of course, we would have our panel of esteemed uh, guests physically in school taking questions from our students. Unfortunately, this year, of course, due to circumstances beyond our control, this has not been possible. However, we're not going to allow COVID-19 and the lockdown to stop us from continuing to learn from each other. And so through the wonders of modern technology and the divine blessings of Microsoft Teams, I'm delighted to welcome back, at least digitally, some very familiar faces. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all again today. If I could please first ask you all to introduce yourselves and perhaps in true British tradition, we can start with ladies first. Okay, I guess that means me. Uh, I think I'm a lady. Uh, <laughs> so hello everybody, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Gen Kelsang Lexang. Uh, I'm uh, the resident teacher at Kadem Kadampa Meditation Centre Birmingham, which is part of a large international network of Kadampa Buddhist centres. Uh, that have been established uh, by our teacher, Venerable Geshe Kelsang Gyatso, in order to present Buddha's teachings to people um, of the modern world um, in a way that's very, very practical and very accessible without detracting from the true meaning of Buddha's teachings. So um, I teach at the centre, I teach meditation and Buddhist uh, philosophy, psychology, with the principal purpose of simply helping people to find mental peace, to solve their problems. Um, so I'm a Kadampa Buddhist nun. I've been a nun uh, since 2007. And yeah, I'm delighted to be joining you today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Uh, Matt, please. Do you mind if you unmute yourselves? Yeah, I'm Reverend Matt Wilson, uh, Minister of Rohith Pavilion Church, which is uh, very close to the school. And uh, I've been uh, coming in uh, to do assemblies, as some of you will know that, and have been a part of this Interfaith Week and have a close attachment to the school with having a couple of girls there as well. Um, and so it's a real pleasure to be here and to be invited to be a part of the Interfaith Week. Um, my Christian journey is, has been uh, one where I became a Christian at the age of 17 and uh, uh, at age 19 after uh, sixth form went to work in a church in Jamaica for a year and then after university and then doing another degree in theology I went to America to work in a church and then after that served in Albania for seven years uh, again seeing the church and being a part of that there. Um, but then came to live in Birmingham back in 2007 and have been here ever since. Love this city uh, and love the community of Bourneville uh, and uh, being a part of the Interfaith Week is, uh, is always a special occasion. So, uh, yeah, delighted to be here. Thank you. John? Hi, uh, my name's John Trevor. Humanist UK. Um, for those of you not familiar, humanism is its values around uh, reason, science and the values shared by all human beings. Um, it believes that we should set our moral values thought and that we can live good lives and moral lives without the need of religion or superstition. Um, on a personal level, I am uh, trained and accredited to be a humanist celebrant. So I take funerals, 
weddings and baby namings for people who don't want God, prayers, hymns, and so on for in their ceremonies. Instead, we focus on human values. Thank you, John. And uh, last but not least, uh, Molana Hamayu. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back on this interfaith program with you all. Um, as as uh, Mr. Okar mentioned, my name is Humayun Jahangir Khan. I am an imam for the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Um, not a lot to say, to be honest, but uh, I've been serving in, in Walsall as the local imam uh, at Beit al -Makid for just over a year now. And uh, for a boy coming da up, down from Surrey up to the Midlands, it's a big change, but it's been a wonderful year for me um, getting to meet the communities. Um, a large part of my work is working with the youth and teaching them the true teachings of, of the Holy Quran and, and the true meaning of Islam, which means peace. Um, and also reaching out to all all our neighbors and all people from all walks of life. So um, it's, uh, like I said, it's a great pleasure to be on this platform talking to people of all different faiths. And this is uh, really what uh, our teachings really um, consist of, is reaching out to all people of uh, different beliefs and being able to speak on the same platform. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. So the format will be as follows. We'll be exploring three uh, particular topics for discussion today. The first of these is related to COVID-19 and how the pandemic has affected uh, your respective communities and in what ways you have responded to the crisis. The second topic is attitudes to uh, equality. Um, and diversity, and in particular, racism in light of the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. And finally, again, in view of recent events, especially in France, I'd like us to focus on freedom of expression and ask whether there should be any limits to free speech. So each of you will have some time to respond to each question, and which we hope will be the basis for a very healthy and productive exchange of ideas. So if you could please, uh, first start by asking a question in relation to the impact of COVID-19 and the lockdown on faith communities especially. So what have been the challenges? How have your members been coping in what are very different and difficult circumstances? And what have you as leaders been doing to reach out to them? And perhaps you could also offer some advice to students and others who are watching this. So if I could please start with uh, Matt Wilson, please. Yeah, so um, in terms of how we have responded uh, in the local community uh, around Roheath and Bourneville, uh, we were a church of about 120, but about 2,000, 2,500 people use the facilities of the church each week. and. Um, and so we've been doing online services for folk and we've been doing lots of different uh, events and activities to engage people. Our food bank has been a continuing presence within the community and many within the community, both in the church uh, and the surrounding area have contributed to that food bank at this time. Um, we've also conducted uh, not just simply online services, but when there was a bit of a break during the summer, we had outdoor services on a Sunday and the weather was very good during that time and people were out and about and we were able to uh, exist alongside the community and share that sense of being together in a physical space, although socially distanced. We also opened our building for TORS, which is a organisation in Northfield, which is called This Active Wellbeing Society. So we're wanting to really cover over both the spiritual and the physical and practical elements of what it means to uh, to support people through this COVID-19. I'm also on a weekly Zoom call with folk in the local community in BVT, Bourneville Village Trust and the Birmingham City Council to think about ways in terms of mental health and well-being as a part of uh, reaching out to people who are struggling at this time. Also, we are there. You can hear that's my dog in the background. I've got a cockapoo, so sorry about that. He's trying to uh, just uh, get some food, I think. But um, also, we've got many people in our church who are part in an elderly care home, and uh, and so that's a part of the aspect as well. I've been doing a number of funerals also throughout this time. So since March, I've been up at Lodge Hill Cemetery on a very regular occasion. 
and uh, being a people of prayer for our key workers has been an aspect of this as well. So, yeah, lots of things that we've been involved in. Uh, thank you. Um, John, please. So, um, however, as an organization, we have um, all sorts of uh, sorry, am I, am I being audible? Am I online? Yes, that's fine, John. Yeah. I can hear you okay. Um, what we do have is a network of 250 which is equivalent of a chaplain. They work in hospitals, in prisons, in hospices, and all sorts of other areas where they can offer comfort to people struggling um in their current circumstances so those are sort of one of the very specific things we've been doing as an organization is offering pastoral support to those that need it um, on a wider basis um humanist by definition and many many of us volunteer in all sorts of ways our central office has been directing its members to various voluntary organisations, um, including COVID-19 Mutual Aid, the HUK Telephone Befriending Scheme, uh, the British Red Cross Reserve Volunteer Scheme, and many, many other either national or local um, civic uh, um, I mean, all, all the things that people who want to contribute to society do, um, humanists do um, tri triply because our entire philosophy is around supporting um, the community. And in terms, I, I like, uh, like Matt, I've been on Lodge Hill a lot. There, there was, a, of course, a spike in um, taking funerals, weddings. Um, sadly have mostly been put on hold because of the COVID restrictions, but hopefully um, I've been advising couples about what they can do in the coming years. Um, and we're moving towards a position where humanists can give registrars and religious leaders. And lastly, um, on an even broader um, sense, you asked for a possible advice for your pupils, um, the foundation of humanism is in reason and science. And so we're encouraging our members, we're encouraging the public, we're encouraging everybody during the approach to themselves and to others, to listen very carefully to what the science says, to very carefully look at the evidence behind people offering with opinions about masks based in nothing but their own opinions. We're encouraged to look at um, what's behind it, to use reason to decide the best behaviour for themselves and others. And I think that's that's what we have to offer as humans. Thank you, John. Um, we seem to be losing you on, on occasions. Maybe it's the connection on your side, but I hope we can uh, resolve that. Uh, um, thank you. Um, uh, Jen Kelsang, please. Okay, um, so at the centre in Birmingham and also at our centres all over the world, um, we closed our centres to the general public back in March um, in accordance with government guidelines. And within a few days of making that decision, it was incredibly inspiring because all of us somehow managed to uh, become IT gurus and uh, master um, technologies such as Zoom and we basically didn't miss a beat with our meditation classes. So here in Birmingham since March we've been offering daily meditation classes, morning classes, lunchtime classes, evening classes, weekend classes which have been very very well attended by our regular community but they're also open to anybody and everybody. So in these classes, um, we guide people through simple meditations, like right? starting with breathing meditation, 
um, and also more advanced and more transformative meditations. And in all our classes, as we always do all through the year and in normal circumstances, we share Buddhist psychology and philosophy, uh, which is also based on reason and direct experience to help people to find methods within their mind that can help them to respond to their daily challenges in a more positive way. So we've been very much encouraging people to, um, to yeah, look within themselves and learn from this present experience uh, and learn some very valuable lessons such as the fact that, you know, one thing I think that is very helpful to contemplate is this, this situation is showing us that we're all, we're all in the same boat. We're all connected by common shared human experiences. You know, I think it's helping us potentially to open our eyes to the reality. Everybody struggles in one way or another and to try and recognize that deeply from our hearts so that we can improve our kindness and understanding of everybody and anybody. So we've also been, uh, you know, teaching methods such as learning to accept difficulties, you know, learning to accept that actually, whether, whether something is a problem for us or not, whether we get unhappy about it or not, it, it largely depends upon how we view the situation. So we've been exploring lots and lots of methods for learning to look at situations with positive and peaceful minds so that we can learn to stay calm, at least some of the time, you know, make good decisions, at least some of the time. Uh, you know, so, you know, for example, within this situation, I know one thing I personally been finding incredibly helpful is seeing the lessons within this situation, seeing the opportunities within this situation, seeing the opportunities you know, has been mentioned to recognise we all ha we're all stronger than we think, we're all more resilient than we think, um, and ultimately we're all the same. And you know we've seen incredible kindness at this time coming from many many people, including um, my my fellow guests on this panel, and we can delight in that. Um, yeah, and feel we're not alone. Okay, thank you. Super, thank you. And uh, we'll have a point. Yes, thank you. Um, we'll just thank you to all the guest speakers so far, and it's incredible the works that have, have been going on. Sometimes we don't get the chance to voice what we've actually have, what we've actually done. So it's, I, I give credit to everyone for everything that's been going on so far, and the work that will continue. Um, because we are speaking to to uh, to schoolgirls, I would say that in our community, since the lockdown started, uh, the women's organisation in the Ahmadiyya Muslim Association played probably the most pivotal role, um, not just in the Midlands, but in fact all around the world. Um, through our charity, which is known as Humanity First, uh, uh, we in over 66 countries we were able to. And make over 150,000 PPEs, masks, sanitizers, um, cleaning materials, uh, which is incredible. And a lot of these uh, face masks were, were homemade um, and they're still being produced even now. Uh, so it's a big, big demand and our community are not just not just within our own community, but for everyone. And we we have helped over 101 hospitals around the world and delivered over 5 million uh, meals uh, for people uh, who are in need. And this is all because the Holy Quran teaches that it teaches us that we should help those people who are in need, uh, those people who are going through a tough time. And the lockdown showed us that, and it was a, it was a big lesson for our community as well. That it was a test. That can we live up to the teachings of the Holy Quran? And I do believe that uh, by the grace of God that we were able to step up to that challenge uh, and help those people that really needed it. And we really saw. Um, how our community came together and reach out to other communities as well. And, you know, it's not a matter of, of faith. It's a matter of uh, what your heart is telling you. And we really believe that um, those people who, who are crying out for help, we tried our best, our level best to go out and help them. 
and this is not just uh, uh, women, but everyone in our community, the elders, the youngsters, uh, we all played a, a pivotal role in trying to help our communities in and around us. So um, it, it, was, it was nice to see that, but in terms of, of helping our community in, in what my role was, uh, like the previous speaker mentioned, uh, we we're all more familiar with Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams as well. And every every day we have some sort of class, you know, teaching the Holy Quran or reaching out to the children, just seeing how they're doing. And if there was one advice that I would give to everyone is it is that um, the welfare system uh, is so important. Reaching out to people who you know and who you don't know. Um, just getting to know them and just checking up on them is so important and as an imam uh, my you could say my family grew uh, so so much i went from a, f a family of my wife and two kids to looking after over 700 people and in different communities in the midlands um so trying to check in check in on them every single day just contacting 10 or 20 people a day uh, it really makes a big difference and you they you really realize how much it means to people so if that was one advice i would i would say to reach out to your loved ones and to your friends and families okay so dr jacoby um the impact of covid19 uh and the lockdown on faith communities especially i'm very keen to know more about the challenges that uh birmingham progressive synagogue have been facing in these very difficult uh circumstances that we're facing um how would you say your members have been coping under the circumstances uh, what would you say as a leader you've been doing to reach out to uh, your members uh, and perhaps if there's any advice you can also give to our students and others who are watching this? It's been a real challenge as, as you can imagine as it's been for everybody and I think the first few weeks were incredibly difficult because we were learning to come to terms with technology and we realised straight away that we needed to do services on Zoom. Fortunately, I'd done a couple of classes on Zoom already, so I knew a little bit about it. But that was very different from running services. And so it took a bit of getting used to. Um, and a lot of our members needed help with it. So we had some wonderful volunteers who would talk to them over the phone and encourage them and help them. And I have to say that's not complete because I think for some of our members, they thought it would just be a few months and then they'd be back with the community. And now with this second lockdown, it's very clear that we don't really know when we'll be back in our synagogue mem building. So those members who are finding technology most different, difficult now want to join. <coughs> I think what members found when they did join was that you could still have a community online. We love seeing each other on a Shabbat morning. We do have services on a Shabbat. Orthodox communities wouldn't because they wouldn't want to use the technology on the Sabbath. They consider it, it not permitted, but we do. And there's a real sense and we have breakout groups so that people can chat to each other and people just love seeing each other even though it's electronic and I think for me one of the, the big questions is we've got so used to it it's going to be strange going back in person I met somebody from the congregation recently and we both said how strange it was to see each other in reality and I do worry in a way that we've got so used to this virtual world that it'll be hard to switch back to a normal world when as soon as we can but we have missed the hugs and we have missed the handshakes um we have also been careful to keep in touch with people who aren't on zoom so we've been phoning um we haven't really visited we've been very careful about covid because it's our most vulnerable members most often who don't have the technology, but we have been reaching out to them by phone and sending them um, printed publications as well to keep in touch with them. And we've been trying to keep the community together. And in many ways, it's been amazing what we could achieve. So at our festival of Simpatura, when we normally dance around with our scrolls, we've had people 
um, play music, talk about the Torah, what it means to them. My children put a presentation together so that somehow we've managed to keep things together and celebrate together. Super. Now, thank you very much. Uh, it's been great to hear some of the, the great work that you've all been doing. Fantastic. Um, I will may come back to some of the points raised uh, if there's time uh, at the end of the uh, of the discussion. Um, if I just go on to our our second topic, um, the killing of George Floyd in America, as we know, sh sent uh, shockwaves around the world and it highlighted perhaps more than ever the mistreatment of, of black people. But wider than that, the deep seated uh, problem of racism, not just in the United States, but across the world and indeed the obstacles that are often faced by ethnic communities and minority groups at all levels of society. Firstly, I'd like to ask, what are your thoughts about what happened in America? And secondly, how do you think that the cancer of prejudice and discrimination, whether it's related to race, gender or anything else, can be removed, if at all? Um, if I could please uh, ask uh, John to start with that one. Thank you. Um, I, I think I have an easier task possibly than some of my co-panelists on this topic. Uh, some of them have to... I have things to say about slavery and the role of women and about homosexuality, uh, about groups and tribes with different values that are quite at odds with many modern values. dance because uh, humanism is based absolutely on a philosophy of shared humanity and sexual orientation, ability, disability. We, we strive and we are of course an actively uh, campaigning group. So we campaign for women's rights, we campaign for gay rights, uh, we campaign against discrimination. Uh, as you know there was um, a lot of hoo-ha here in Birmingham about um, the teaching of equal marriage in schools and we were very active in campaigning there uh, because that's a form of discrimination where some people can get married and some people can't. Uh, so we've been level. Um, in June 2020, Humanist International issued a statement, of course, like many other organisations did, condemning the killing of George Floyd, offering Floyd, offering support to the Black Lives Matters movement. Um, but statements are easy to make. Um, much more important is, of course, individual response. Um, again, as humanists, we fundamentally... equal society and we actively campaign for equality for all. Um, I can't say that race is one of our active campaigns at the moment, although fighting religious discrimination is very much um, one of the things we tackle. Um, uh, apostasy um, and discrimination on that front is something we fight. responding to prejudice and discrimination uh, on as many fronts as we can afford to be uh, as a charity and as individuals uh, obviously as a as a wedding celebrant i take um marriages for weddings for uh, people of all gen um, sexual orientations including gay marriages very happy to support love in any form it takes wherever it appears um, love should be the fundamental value that we all encompass um Think that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, if I could please ask uh, Reverend Wilson to uh, respond to uh, John there, please. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John, for sharing. And uh, I've got no dog now. I've changed my room, though, so the background has changed. No interruptions with the dog. All should be well. But um, yeah, this this was a when uh, this question came. Um, it brought back memories of that moment when we saw on our screens about George Floyd, and it wasn't just George Floyd. There were actually many other instances, and 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 those instances themselves are, um, in one sense, the history of humanity. From my perspective, is one which uh, has been, whether it's been religious or not religious, there have been moments uh, in our history which has been a shared sense of shame uh, in ways in which one 
person treats another and discrimination and prejudice and racism uh, ha of all kinds have been uh, a part of the history of humanity, it seems. And, and, and so to see that rear itself again um, through that instance with George Floyd was, was uh, abhorrent and it was a shock. Uh, and, um, and as a church, we, we thought uh, and reflected upon it uh, in, 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 in a significant way. We, uh, we gathered together. We are a fairly, if I say, a, a monocultural sort of group of people in, in, in a majority sense. We have some people from, from Asia and, and Africa within our uh, congregation here at Roe Heath, but uh, majority is sort of white middle class, if I can put it that way. But we were really thinking and reflecting, not in our own community, but with other Christians around about uh, what does it mean to, uh, to, to repent, to say sorry for the past, to reflect on the present and to seek to understand um, because we all come at this from different perspectives. I think the thing that united everyone was the sense of outrage and injustice and the need to stand up and to speak out. One of the things that came out in response was the uh, view that all lives matter. But actually, we challenged that perspective because this was uh, an issue of injustice. And it was that black lives matter because black lives were being persecuted and black lives were being discriminated against. So there was a need to emphasise the sense of black lives matter. Absolutely. One of the things we did as a, a staff team as a church, so it's not just me that is head of the church, but there are a couple of other people involved in leading the church. One is an American lady and one is a guy who's from Uganda. And in our online service via Facebook Live, uh, together we shared our stories. Uh, one growing up in Uganda, another growing up in Ohio, America, and me with my story from a white middle class background in Cambridgeshire, moving to Kingston, Jamaica and being uh, involved in a church in downtown Kingston. And we were sharing our perspectives on uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And at the end of the service, we all uh, bowed down and bent the knee in front of people online as a sign of solidarity, uh, as a sign of wanting to address this situation. Uh, one of uh, my uh, heroes of the faith, Martin Luther King, who was not perfect, but was uh, such an incredible inspiration to me, uh, passionate in uh, alleviating uh, injustice, said injustice every, uh, anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And you and I know together that iconic speech on August the 28th, 1963, when he said at the Lincoln Memorial, I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of swelter the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. And he continued in that in that um, speech, which was not just a one-off speech. I think he'd said that speech a number of times before. But he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. And of course, an applause rang out. And those words still ring true in a sense of a hopeful desire today. Humanity has shown that uh, it, discrimination and prejudice is still prevalent within society today and it needs to be addressed. A speech back in 1963 was a speech that looked back into the horrors of humanity, but also in one sense addressed the present reality. But there is uh, beyond that, in, our, you know, in the, in, the, in the decades following that speech, a continuation of injustice and prejudice. And so as a Christian, I believe that God is the God of love, God is love and God acts in love and part of God's loving act is his creation and that we as humanity are made in God's image and to be made in God's image is to reflect that love in the world and love isn't just some soft cuddly thing, love is to speak out against injustice, love is to show compassion 
and kindness. In the Old Testament, in Amos, the prophet it says these words, let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. In one sense, Martin Luther King got inspiration from those Old Testament prophets. Or Isaiah said, let learn to do right, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed. And Jesus himself, who is the pinnacle of our faith, uh, he is someone who showed us the way to reflect God in the world. He crossed boundaries of race, ethnicity, class and gender. He reached out to the marginalised and the lonely and the downtrodden. And so as a Christian, uh, this is a hugely important and significant issue, the issue of justice and alleviating prejudice and discrimination. If God is love and we are called to love one another, then uh, the dream is still on for the reality of that. Take. Thank you, Matt. Um, we're going to invite uh, again Kelsang to uh, share her thoughts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, the events that took place in America earlier in the year were of course uh, very sad. Um, and I must say at that time, I and I know my, my, my fellow Kadampa Buddhists found our, our faith and our practice incredibly helpful. Um, so, you know, I, I always think Buddha taught, and this is definitely my experience through my own direct observation, that Yes, of course, every living being is equal, regardless of their race, regardless of their religion, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of their sexuality. All living beings are equal. But unfortunately, at present, all living beings, myself included, <laughs> have a very self-centered uh, perspective on the world. So we all have um, strong self-interest and as a result of that we view others according to how they affect us you know we have strong views and so necessarily we some often develop aversion towards people who have different views or it's very easy for us to do develop dislike towards people who are different from us or who challenge us in some way. This is normal. This is this is part of the human condition. You know, and likewise, we also develop strong attachment to people who share our views, people who are like us, people who agree with us, people who we feel comfortable with. Now, for as long as the living beings in this world, myself included, suffer from these mistaken views, we call it um, you know, self-cherishing, attachment and anger. There will always be some level of prejudice in our minds. You know, you can't legislate against prejudice. For as long as living beings have these, these distorted views of the universe, this self-centered view, this will happen. So uh, my response to the to the events in in the US was not to get political about it. Um, as Kadampa Buddhists, we don't we, I, we don't get involved in politics. Um, but to we're encouraged to all look within our own minds. It's got to start with us. So for me, it had to start with me. And my response was to increase my determination to develop my pure love for others to develop a mind of equanimity which is a mind that not just thinks up here from my head but from my heart a mind that recognizes the simple truth which is that every single living being without exception is equal is fundamentally the same in that deep down all of us just want to be happy and we just want to be free from suffering. In this respect, if we just look at the basic wishes of all living beings, we're all the same. And the only way I believe through my own direct experience and observation and analysis and contemplating Buddhist teachings, the only way we can develop pure love, pure love, 
being this mind that really believes that others are precious, that their happiness matters. The only way we can do this is through training and meditation. And that just means becoming deeply familiar from our heart with the truth, you know? So, so and of course, this takes time. So I believe in starting with myself and through that I can help others through my, through my example, um, through my actions, and, and in my case, through also through teaching to do the same. And this is how we'll change the world. But I don't believe it's helpful to point the finger at other people and say, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, because that's actually part of the problem. OK, so I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Walsh. Thank you uh, again, Carl Sang. Molana uh, Hamayim, please. Yes. Um, so, as already mentioned previously, when this incident uh, began with George Floyd, of course, it was a shock to the whole world. Um, anyone who has seen the video uh, will agree. Um, and naturally, when such events happen, you know, it triggers emotions, it triggers people, uh, especially people who feel that they belong to that certain group. Um, within our Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, we, we consider ourselves very fortunate uh, because we do have a spiritual head, uh, a leader, um, the fifth caliph uh, of our community, whose name is Mirza Masroor Ahmed. Um, and anything um, that occurs within our lives or, or such, such incidents in the world, uh, we always seek guidance from him. And so naturally, when this when this incident occurred, we have members in America uh, of African American um, of back background, um, and so everyone was everyone was writing, everyone was asking, what should we do? Um, should we take part in protests? Should we take part in um, the physical violence that's going on? What what should we do? Um, and as our our Khalifa made it very clear um, that. You should never ever take part in protests which causes any sort of violence or any sort of criminal activity uh, that will damage the nation, that will damage people, that will damage people's properties. And we saw that happening, unfortunately, and we stand against that. Um, if you were to do any sort of protest, it would only be for peaceful protests. Um, and this is really the, this is a short term uh, solution, you can say. But you have to look at a long-term solution. And as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, that it comes within yourself. It comes within educating yourself um, and educating others on every single level. And we truly believe that through the Holy Quran and um, through uh, the teachings of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that we can educate other people of the true teachings, um, not just of our religion, but of all religions um, and on every level, in fact. Um, and so through education and through self-reformation, um, these things can be done. Uh, and when, uh, of course, this um, incident happened, uh, this hashtag about Black Lives Matter was going around. Um, when the, the Khalifa thought about this, he pondered over this. Uh, he said, make sure you also add um, innocent lives matters and supremacy of justice, because this actually encapsulates every single person. Um, and this is directly from the Holy Quran because uh, the Holy Quran teaches us that if someone um, kills uh, anyone, an innocent person, it's like he has killed all of humanity or all the whole world. Uh, but if he even saves one person, it's like he has saved the whole world. Um, and so this, on this basis, this is how we live our lives. Uh, we must try to defend the rights of others um, on every level and we must also protect those who are innocent. Um, and in that way, we really believe that you can establish uh, world peace and um, the love that um, the previous speakers have been speaking about, um, that also can be established. God willing. I think what happened to George Floyd was appalling. And of course, he wasn't the first and he wasn't the last. And I um, think, you know, we were all rightly shocked by what happened. In this country, it's also brought attention to ongoing racism here. And I think we have to be really aware of that and of the concerns of people in this country. Um, 
and some of the accounts I've heard, and I'm sure it doesn't apply to Kings Norton, but I've heard the accounts of some school children saying what racism they suffered, and I thought we'd got way beyond that, so that's shocking to hear. Um, Judaism, at its most fundamental, teaches that all people are equal. The story of Adam and Eve teaches that all people are descendant from one human being, well, two human beings, Adam and Eve. And even if we don't take that literally, we can still believe that in the lessons that it teaches us. And our Torah also tells us time and again to care for the stranger. It reminds us that every human being is made in the image of God. So Judaism does teach us to respect everybody. Um, doesn't say that Jews aren't immune from racism, sadly. Um, I don't think anybody is. And I've been brought, been asked uh, um, as a magistrate to do unconscious bias training, and that's really a revelation because it really it teaches the biases that we all have. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say that we're all racist, but we do all have unconscious bias and it's really important to be aware of that um, but at the same time you know Jews have often been at the forefront of anti-racism in the American civil rights movement in the 1960s um, rabbis marched alongside Martin Luther King against discrimination and we can't look back and say great we did that we have to look forward and we have to keep on putting across the message that everybody matters, that black lives matter particularly. I mean, I think, you know, it's a dangerous argument to criticise the Black Lives Matter slogan because the point is that people have tended to think that black lives don't matter. So, of course, everybody's lives matter, but we have often forgotten that black lives matter as much as white lives. So it's important to keep that message alive and to educate our children as I know you're doing and to educate our adults too and to stand up to racism. I think it's quite significant that yesterday was the anniversary of Kristallnacht, the first pogrom as it were of the Nazi period when Jews were murdered and synagogues were burnt and of course we have our mist um, tomorrow so it's a timely reminder, sorry I'm doing this on a different day, so it's a timely reminder of what can happen if we forget those messages. Thank you very much, um, some very comprehensive uh, responses there from everybody. Um, I will give a chance for uh, responses to other comments. I think once we've gone through our third and final question, um, should time allow. Um, so it was only a few weeks ago when uh, another uh, killing caused worldwide uh, outrage. Uh, this time it was in France. And the background to this is that a school teacher was teaching uh, his students about freedom of expression. And during the lesson, he decided to show cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, the founder of Islam. But these are cartoons that have caused offence to many Muslims uh, who, as part of their faith, do not approve of any drawings or depictions of the Prophet, or indeed any other Prophet for that matter. However, one individual took extreme offence and murdered the teacher shortly afterwards. This was clearly an act of terrorism, uh, and uh, Muslims also condemned this uh, uh, particular uh, attack. Uh, what this incident also raised was the issue of free speech, uh, and whether people should have the right to speak their mind, uh, and to use freedom of expression in a way that is unrestricted uh, and also possibly uh, cause offence. It's of course a very sensitive issue uh, and my question to you is, um, do you think there is a need to strike a balance somewhere uh, when it comes to free speech? Uh, and if so, how? I'm interested in your thoughts in relation to that. Maybe, Molana Humayu, you, if we could maybe start with you, as this particular story has really affected Muslims also. Uh, yes, exactly. And uh, may I be the first to condemn all these attacks, um, any attack which is done under the name of Islam, which is uh, which people say this is 
it's this is because I'm doing it for the sake of God or my religion teaches this is completely wrong. And this is all a lack of education, unfortunately. Um, and the Ahmadiyya Muslim community are, are probably the first people who stand against this. Um, straight away, we we went to the media, we, we tried to educate them on what the true teachings of Islam is. Um, and for those who don't know, Islam literally means peace. And so anything out of that, um, anything which causes anything other than peace is out of the fold of Islam. Um, so when these attacks happen, uh, it grieves us greatly because it means that now we have to start again. We have to start educating people again on what the true teachings of Islam are. Um, and everything that we, we do in our lives is um, from the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he showed us practically how we should treat people. And this is the man who was, who was tortured for many, many years. Uh, when he was uh, initially told that he was the Prophet, um, his own family were persecuted, his, his followers were persecuted. Uh, he was made to be um, expelled from his own, own homeland and told to, to leave. Um, so many, so many persecutions that he went through, but never did he talk against anyone. Never did he say any bad word about anyone. Uh, he taught us not to be indecent, to not uh, embellish stories, uh, and saying good things is a virtue provided that the good things are are always there. Um, so, where Islam stands on this is is very clear, and uh, we must uh, exercise free speech within. Uh, the no normalities of not uh, harming anyone, of not um, upsetting anyone. Um, and we must all be able to exercise our religion and our teachings in a way which doesn't hurt anyone. Um, and that truly was the, the life and character of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And even when he came back to Mecca, when he was allowed to come back and told, that, told by God that you can come back to your homeland, Every single person that did anything against him, he told them that there is no blame on you today. That I have forgiven all of you, and this is how everyone should be. And this immediately called all the all the anger and all the all the frustrations that everyone had. And this is the real example of how we should be today. And not um, defend the Holy Prophet by boycotting anyone, uh, as we are seeing around the world now. Um, this is also wrong. Uh, the best way um, to to defend the Holy Prophet and his characters by sending salutations on him, by remembering him, um, by writing to newspapers, uh, by educating people, as I mentioned before, and uh, even students speaking up in their schools and telling their teachers of what the true teachings of Islam are. These are the ways how you will truly establish um, uh, peace uh, within the communities and within uh, the society. But at the same time, you will see how freedom of speech really should be exercised. And I believe um, everyone is capable of doing it. And it's totally wrong to to hurt or abuse any other faith or any other religion or any other beliefs of any background. Um, so this is what our stance is on, on the freedom of speech and the recent incidents in France. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Wilson, please. That's really helpful to hear that. Um, and uh, thank you so much for sharing, because I, I guess it's closer to home uh, from a from an Islamic perspective. Um, so I really appreciated all that you just shared. This is a, a, a very delicate subject, but a brilliant question that has been raised and, um, and one that all schools, I think, should be addressing. And so uh, I think it's uh, wonderful that we're able to, to talk about this together in this Interfaith Week. Um, the situation in France with the teacher was also in a similar time to when you had uh, the breaking into the Catholic Church and uh, that one presiding, you know, the, the priest presiding at mass was shot too. And, and, and these cases, um, uh, and we could provide others as well. The, the whole thing about the freedom of speech, I think we'd all agree that we want to support freedom of speech. Um, and uh, there is in our own traditions, whether that be a, a, a faith perspective or a humanist perspective, I guess a, a real framework, a worldview that would support, obviously, freedom of speech. From a Christian perspective, there are lots of uh, Bible verses that relate to that in 
in the gospel, the gospel simply means good news. And if you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, that, that John's gospel says, so if the if Jesus sets you free, you will be free indeed. Um, and then there are other verses as well about in the New Testament, it says, for you were called, you were invited to, to freedom, to experience freedom. But don't use your freedom as an opportunity for bad, but through love, serve one another. So what I'm trying to say there is, it's a biblical understanding, but it's also set within the framework of many world religions and none, this framework of freedom. But freedom is not new, it doesn't have a neutral value. <laughs> the Bible just said there that don't use your freedom as an opportunity for bad. And I think this is a really important point, actually, because um, if we all just simply have a, a view that freedom is good, full stop, then actually left to our own devices. I think <laughs> the examples that we've shared and we could share many more examples and it's not just within uh, <laughs> a Muslim context, let me put it that way. There are many examples across all contexts where people use freedom for bad. And uh, I think <laughs> the political realm, let me say, without using many names or any names, you know, certain tweets that are put out there, you are free to put a tweet out there, but actually that tweet is censored because it might not be true. And there's a whole debate right now about how social media is used in, in the political sphere as well as the personal realm as well. The point being is that freedom isn't neutral value. It can be used both for good and for bad. Um, uh, and I think in the world today, in any uh, structure, there is a need for uh, for guidance. There is a need for uh, for rules, even, dare I say. I think I might have used this example before in an Aim to Faith forum about a similar subject where I'm, I'm very heavily into sport. Uh, I love sport of all kinds. And uh, if you play a game of football, let's say, you need rules in order for the game to be played in a free and fair way. Perhaps referees get a bad name, but they are essential to the flow uh, and freedom of football to be played. You need rules and regulations. So freedom itself needs to be guided. It need, uh, and if anybody's freedom is valued exactly the same as another, then that needs careful consideration because there are viewpoints out there that are extreme, that are not helpful to humanity and therefore need challenging. However, on this issue that happened in France, I believe it was from the context of seeking to educate, actually, seeking to discuss. And I think freedom of expression is necessary within that realm, if you like, that culture of discussion. I think we should respect humanity one to another in a way where discuss discussions should happen. And, um, and so I think freedom is absolutely crucial. I think it's absolutely essential to the flourishing of society, the well-being of humanity. But freedom in a way that is respectful, that is kind, is generous, is, is, uh, is peace-loving. And actually, from my perspective, it's a way of acting in freedom that relates to who God is. If God is love in his freeing love, then we are also called to be that way. I was uh, shocked by what happened in, in Nice, in, in Vienna, in Paris. And um, I think this question actually relates to the previous question. We need to stand up and speak out uh, against um, extremism in relation to freedom. But we also need freedom to be exercised in a way that is good for humanity. So to answer the question in a word, yes, I think there is a need to strike a balance. I'm sure, you know, like everybody, um, the murder of Samuel Patty was absolutely appalling. And um, I was very glad to see how publicly French Muslims condemned that killing. Um, because, however, um, insightful speeches and I, I, I don't 
I, I, I being not being a Muslim, I can't say, you know, I can't say how that applies to Samuel Patti's speech. Nothing justifies killing anybody else. Um, we, I think we have to be open to a wide variety of opinions and including those that are offensive sometimes, as long as they don't cross boundaries. I think we have laws in this country about racism and anti-Semitism and hate, hate speech, which make it clear that some things do go beyond the bounds of what's permitted. And then there are legal sanctions, so nobody should have to take the law into their own hands. And there are liable laws as well if people feel that they've been misrepresented. So those do recognise, and one can argue where the limits are, but they do recognise that there are boundaries. At the same time, Judaism teaches against Lashon Hara, evil speech it's called, against gossip, and particularly about speech which shames other people in public, that, that that's very um, strongly condemned. And we all have a duty to be respectful in our speech, to be kind and compassionate in our speech. And I think that's um, something that we need to remind ourselves of as well. Thank you, uh, Matt Wilson. Um, if I could please ask John to give his input there. Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting hearing what people have had to say so far. Um, <clears throat> humanists are passionate about free speech. Humanism was born out of freedom of expression. Early humanists, 100 because they had the audacity to challenge religious dogma and to question the Bible at a time when that was a very dangerous thing to do. Humanists still encourage everyone to think for themselves, not to accept We believe that all advances have been made and continue to be made by challenging orthodoxy, by challenging accepted ideas, and we don't think there are any ideas that are too sacred to be questioned. But this is still... We can't remove free speech from the politics and the power also of organised religion, I'm afraid. There are still 71 countries in the world where blasphemy is illegal. To say, I don't believe in God is punishable. 43 of those countries will put you in prison, six will put you to death for saying that. So we have to look at the wider context of freedom of speech and say who is controlling that freedom of speech and what invested powers are controlling it. Um, England and Wales only Ireland still have them. In theory, you can still be punished in Scotland and Ireland for expressing doubt about holy truths. So how can we have freedom of speech when those laws still exist? I would say it's not polite to insult others. Nobody should set out to offend. But we can't control who will take offence at what we say. We should be free, we must always be free to propose any ideas we want and to challenge others' ideas. We can't incite violence, we can't shout fire inside a crowded cinema. Those acts are illegal already. They are incitements to violence and they are public disorder. We already have laws against them. But besides of those, we should be free to challenge all orthodoxies and all ideas. If you disagree with somebody's words and ideas, then you should meet and challenge them with other words. If are good enough and strong enough, they will convince others. If you need violence to enforce your ideas, then they're probably not very good ideas to begin with. Otherwise, they would carry their own weight. So I'm a passionate believer that there is no topic that is sacred, there is no subject we can't talk about, and um, if people take offence at freedom of speech, then they should perhaps not listen. We have no obligation to protect others' offence. We do have an obligation to not incite violence, to not incite hatred, 
and to not incite violence against others. Um, that's my position and I believe that's the position of most humanists. Thank you, John. Uh, again, unfortunately, I think we lost you in places, but we've got the main uh, message, I think, which is that uh, as far as humanism is concerned, uh, nothing really is, is off limits. Um, so uh, please invite uh, Jen Kelsang, please, to uh, share her thoughts. OK, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've uh, listened with interest to what all the previous speakers have said. Um, and yes, I believe in freedom of speech, uh, but I also believe very much in taking personal responsibility for my speech. I believe, uh, and Buddha t teaches, that actually, in, actual to ha in order to have real freedom, in order to have real freedom of speech, we, we, we need to be getting to know our own mind. We need to be looking honestly within our own mind. And we need to be honestly checking what is our motivation for speaking. And I think what we'll find, and I, you know, you hear this so much on the global um, you know, communication on, on social media and the news and so forth everybody's got an opinion and the funny thing is we all think that we're right <laughs> now buddha teaches it's not as clear-cut as that you know and actually how do we know we're right we need to be careful not to be attached to our own views and because attachment to our own views is what causes these terrorist attacks it's what causes so much disharmony in this world i don't believe it's the religions themselves it's this view that believes i'm right and you're wrong no so i believe a lot personally in a lot of silence and listening because i can't comment on somebody else's belief system generally because I haven't explored it enough in as much depth as I could. So how can I comment on it? You know, my teacher, Venerable Geshe Kelsang Gyatso, one of the first teachings I received from him touched my heart so much that I, it really moved, I just thought, right, I want you as my spiritual guide. When he said, when you meet someone of another faith or another belief, don't tell them that they're wrong. Don't try to convince them that they're wrong. But try to help them or try to share the common values in what we're talking about, you know, such as love, compassion, wisdom, which I think we've been doing here today. You know, share these common values so that between us we can, I'm not quoting my teacher anymore, <laughs> but between us we can strengthen our what I would call faith, faith in kindness, faith in love, faith in wisdom, faith in reason. Because you know, in Buddhism, faith and reason are not separate. Um, and that way we can create more harmony. So I think real freedom, mental freedom, physical freedom comes from getting control, recognizing, getting control of our own impulsive negative states of mind, such as attachment to our views, which can very easily give rise to anger. So that when we speak, we can be, we can have the peace of mind, the spaciousness of mind to ask ourselves, what is going to be the most beneficial thing to say in this situation? And I agree, sometimes we need to speak the truth even when it's uncomfortable. But we need to check, is this the most beneficial thing to say to this person in this situation? Or is it better to wait, <laughs> you know, and broach this at a different time? So anyway, I personally find that very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we've covered a lot of ground, haven't we? I've talked about COVID-19. Um, the issue of uh, prejudice and racism and other types of inequalities. 
uh, and everyone's been free to share their thoughts about uh, free speech. Uh, we have about five minutes remaining. I would like to invite any uh, responses uh, or further comments in relation to any of the issues that we've raised. And if you'd like to make uh, a comment, then please just raise your uh, hand and then I can uh, bring you in. Um, and, and in terms of you know, the most recent question in relation to free speech, um, I think some really interesting comments made there also in terms of, um, as again, Kelsey, you mentioned about taking responsibility for uh, what you have to say, but sometimes what you have to say might have to be forthright and might be necessary. And I think the question is sometimes, how do you strike that balance? Uh, we also know that, you know, from the history of religions, how, um, you know, what they founders have said was also blasphemous at the time. Um, but how did they respond to people who committed blasphemy against them? Um, and also, you know, we are taught from a very young age that, you know, be nice, be kind to people, say, 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 the, say a kind word. Um, and should that change when we become adults? And then how do we deal with circumstances where people have overstepped the mark, where they have deliberately provoked uh, or they've sought a reaction? Um, and, and what sort of balance can we can we strike there? Um, so if anyone would like to comment on any of those questions and issues, then please feel free to uh, give your, like I said, we've got about four minutes remaining. So um, would anyone like to uh, speak there? Yes, uh, Jen Kelsey, please. Thank you. I think that's, those are very, very good questions and very important questions. Um, so I do think if there is an injustice and if we perceive it to be beneficial to speak up, then we then it is correct to speak up. Um, but it's it we need to be careful. We need to, you know, try and be at peace and try to work out what is the most beneficial thing to say. Will this person be able to hear what I'm saying? Um, in a way that's going to be beneficial. So if, for example, a person has got very, very strong attachment to their views, we may find that what we say is just going to fall on deaf ears. And actually, um, we need to work on our own mind often rather than try and change everybody else. Um, but there are times where if there is a big injustice, maybe we do need to make a big statement. We don't need to expect that person to hear us or change but sometimes we just need to make a big statement that's wrong um, but we need to try and do that with a peaceful loving wise mind um, and then we believe from the point of view of karma that will always have a positive effect okay. thank you uh, Robert Wilson yeah just hearing uh, the last hour or so together and being a part of the interfaith week over the previous years uh it doesn't in one sense matter what questions are asked we all sort of arrive at the same <laughs> destination and that is to identify common features among us that hold us together um the world out there as we all know is in is 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 fragile uh, it, it is broken in many ways. We like to think of progress and development and change. And, and, and like has been said, I think faith and reason go hand in hand. I think actually religion and science, there's many people who are religious who are scientists. But so there is something there. Uh, but there's also within humanity, it doesn't matter if we are from a world religion or not. I think there is uh, a sense where humanity both in one level is seen to progress, but in another level, there is a sense of of, 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 uh, of brokenness there. And one of the things I value greatly in any of these questions is that the common thread that, that, that really holds us together. And I think that's needed now more than ever, whether it be the politics state side or the issues of extremism within a religion, or, 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 or the voice, voice of the minority not being heard, it's clear that actually all of us have a part to play in seeking to uh, build a greater understanding through listening, through learning, through, through beginning to spend time with one another, which is why I value this so much. Um, so it's not really a question so much as it is a comment of appreciation um, So uh, and the value of this. Personal life. 
stamp use violence but gently um there's a phrase um in our prayers actually about the gentle answer that turns away wrath which is very hard to do actually um but i think if one can cultivate that on a personal level and as i said there are you know legal ways of addressing speech that is insightful so they can be reported to the police and i think you know the police in the west midlands do take these things seriously i've been very impressed when i've met with the police they've come to talk to our synagogue and so on but they do take these things seriously so one shouldn't be afraid and to stand up for other people if we see somebody being addressed in a hateful way then it's our obligation to stand up for them and to gently and peacefully rebuke the person who speaks hatefully Thank you very much. Um, John or uh, Moran Humayun would like to add anything to that, Humayun? Yes, please. Yes, just um, I guess as a as closing remarks, because we have come to the end. Uh, firstly, I would just like to thank you for inviting us. Um, and um, just all of us being here today really shows, you know, how when people come together, um, the freedom of speech we're talking about, um, the peace we've been talking about, the love, um, can be shown, um, and this is really the message that we should take from from this program today. Um, and what I would like to say is that if we were to work every single person in the world, and we would just look at ourselves, um, self reformation, look at our weaknesses, and tell ourselves that what can I do to make myself better tomorrow? I think slowly but surely, um, the whole world can move together, um, can move forward together. Um, and this is really what we try to do um, and everyone should actually try to do that as well and the prayers and meditations which have been mentioned today as well are so so important uh, within every religion but even if you don't have a faith um, you should also try and try and practice that as well and we've learned that i think a lot of people have learned that during the lockdown as well that we shouldn't just solely rely on on people and and scientists to find a vaccine we should try and uh, soul search a bit more um, and uh, it's, it's been an incredible discussion and we've, like you said, we've covered so many topics and I've personally learned so many um, new things from all of you. So a big thank you to everyone um, for, for sharing your, your wise knowledge um, with us. Thank you very much. That's a lovely uh, sentiment to, to end on, I think. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. It's been a really uh, fascinating uh, discussion. And, and session. I wish we had more time, but but there we have it. Uh, and on behalf of Kings Norton Girls School, uh, I'm grateful to all of you for your extremely uh, valuable input and insights into some uh, important topics. Uh, you're always very generous uh, with your time, and I'm sure that our students and others watching would have greatly benefited from your from your pearls of wisdom. Uh, I'd just like to uh, just share one quote before we close. Uh, this is a quote from the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, His Holiness Mirza Masur Ahmad, from a speech that he gave last year. And he says that in this globalized world, it is essential that rather than harboring negative feelings and uh, fearing of one another, we should have positive feelings towards others. Certainly, this is the duty of every person who associates themselves to any faith, be they Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, or any other. One way to reduce conflict in the world is to focus on the commonalities that unite us as opposed to the differences that we have. And I think that's a lovely and fitting message to, to end with. Uh, we joined today as friends, and I'm sure we leave as friends. Um, and let's hope that by this time next year, we are out of the COVID woods, so to speak, and have a chance to meet again, not just in spirit, but in body also. Thank you very much again for everyone's time. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks all.